Sefer Kashrut. Yes, so welcome everyone to the second class on Kashrut, and we're going to be studying the laws of waiting between meat and milk. And we discussed a lot of those she taught uh, last time, and we focused on we focused on the fact that according to Harambam, the time difference is the time between one meal to the next, and then normally in those times it was common to have a morning meal and an evening meal, and the time was kama shesh sha'at around six hours. And the fact that he says around six hours, some of the commentators uh, who came after the Rambam want to expound that it's not exactly six hours, but can be like six hours. So, for example, we have here Sefer Kashrut by Rav Ali Yashiv, and Rav Ali Yashiv explains that that uh, those who wish to be mekel, lechol chalavi acha basari, acha shechalfa rov hasha'a shishit, they can eat, if they want to be lenient, they can wait, provided that they have indeed waited the majority of the sixth hour. Okay, so it seems here that there is a leniency here. And in his footnote there on He'era Ayin Vav, he says that uh, you can wait as long as you've waited into the, you've, you're in the, you're, you're now five hours and uh, a few minutes, then it, it, if you are uh, within half an hour, he says, you can rely on it. And he, and he adds here, especially so, if, this is Rav Ali Ashiv here, especially if you are uh, going to have, uh, you're going to uh, elderly relatives, could be great aunt, great uncle, could be grandparents, and they're going to be offended if you don't eat their dairy desserts, and therefore he says you can be lenient once you're in five and a half hours plus, not including the sixth hour. Uh, Hacham of Ajah says, that uh, he wants to limit the scope to this. And Hacham of Vajah says that the, the, the really this is only for pressing circumstances. And also if you've had a chicken meal as opposed to a red meat meal. And the reason being that the chicken and dairy doesn't have, strictly speaking, this, as we learned last time, this requirement of waiting six, of, uh, it's not the same, because it's only rabbinic, it's not the same as the do'oraita, of not eating the meat and the milk together, or cooking the meat and milk together, or driving benefit for the meat and milk together. So he sees a reason to be lenient regarding this. Okay? That's Hacham of Ajah there on page 36 and 37. Uh, And same thing here with you, put yourself down there on the bottom. Okay, so that's it. I want to go a little bit faster through this because uh, it's all pretty straightforward. Okay. Now, another question which always comes up in this Kashrut question is, when do I start the time where I'm now allowed to uh, eat this meat? I mean, sorry, sorry, to, when, when I can start to have this dairy. Am I starting the count from the moment that I finish eating the meat in the meal? Or does the time begin when I finish saying Birkat Hamazon? Okay? And no surprises, two Jews, three opinions, we're going to argue about this as well. And the Aruch HaShulchan presents the position that he said, it's not when you finish eating the meat, it's when you finish the su'uda. And therefore he says in this situation, one would have to wait not only at the point where you finished eating, but the time where you finished the su'uda. As it says here, Veda. The waiting of the six hours is from the end of the meat meal. Add to the beginning of the dairy meal. 
התחלת הסעודה לא יאכל חלב, או שבסוף סעודת הבשר לא אכל בשר, מפני שגמר הקפידו מסעודה לסעודה. So it explains here, and this is a very important principle, when we're listening to the language of the Gemara, the language of the Gemara said what? The language of the Gemara was mesuda le suda, from one meal to the next. And since it's from one meal to the next, the Aruch HaShulchan wants to be very specific here. And he says, since it's one meal to the next, it doesn't matter if I'm having a dessert which has no meat in it, and if I'm having a starter course which has no dairy in it, it has to be six full hours from the end, from the Bikad Amazon, until the beginning of the dairy meal. The Dagul Mervava and Yalkut Yosef both argue, and they both say that the six hours is from the end of eating the meat until the beginning of eating the cheese. So therefore, if I know that my lunch meal on Shabbat, let's say, for example, not, not our Seattle Sephardic custom, but let's say I had carne, I had meat on Shabbat lunch, and I finished eating the chamin or whatever meat I'm going to have uh, at two o'clock, but the meal itself finished at three, According to the Yalkut Yosef and the Dalgul Mervava, I could then have something dairy at eight o'clock, whereas for the Aruch HaShulchan, I would have to wait until nine o'clock. So therefore you can see this edge. So you can add these positions. You can take five hours and a half, plus when I last eating meat, and so therefore you could have a very big range of positions of, you can make it into a math equation here, or a problem of what point can these children have their ice cream after they had their meat lunch? And you could create a whole uh, system. And you can say, well, based on the Aruch HaShulchan, it's not until nine o'clock, but based on the Dagu Mervava and the Yaku Yosef, perhaps it's 7.30, because they're waiting on it's a time when you finish eating meat, and they're waiting five and a half hours and not six. Okay. Carrying on onto page 40. Uh, the Sefer Kashut, which again by, uh, by Rav Eliashiv, it brings the same position as, as Rav Yitzchak Yosef, that uh, you can begin the dairy meal within the six hours, provided that you're not eating the chalavi, the dairy, until the six hours are concluded, exactly the same. Now, there's a custom which many of you are aware of, that a lot of Jews, especially from Germany and England and South Africa, have the custom of waiting three hours, not six hours, not one hour, but three hours. And so far, in all the shitot that we've seen, we haven't seen a position for three hours. So where does this three hours come up from? Where do we learn this from? So the three hours is as follows. Three hours is like this. We're on page 40. V'chein nahag ma'ukva b'pnei sheha basar v'hashuman nidbak b'peh zman aroch. Ma'ukva said the reason why one has to wait from meat until dairy is because the fat, it gets stuck in the mouth for a very long time, okay? And then he writes, ki reish bet. And this reish bet, they're not sure who it is. We're going to say that it's Rabbeinu Baruch, who's one of the Balea Tosfot although it hasn't been found in the Tosfot, but according to this sefer called the Isser Veheter of Rabbeinu Yerucham, he writes, Rabbeinu Baruch wrote, Mipnei she basar she bein hashinayim karui basar she neemar ha basar odeinu bein shinehem vehu shalosh sha'ot kerashi. And he writes something very strange, which is hard to understand, and he writes that it is because the meat between the teeth, that's called meat, that's fine. But he writes, the time for this is three hours, as in he considers the time for it to, con to be called meat in the teeth is only three hours. And as I said, this is a very 
interesting source because the source that he's quoting, Rabbeinu Baruch, is nowhere to be found, and we're not quite sure exactly to whom or to what he is referring. And then here we have, this is an interesting uh, shoot from Mishneh Halachot, and he says as following this, and I'll, I'll read this one to you together with you in English. She says, regarding the custom of our brothers from Germany, so that's the Yekesha Minhag, who have the custom of waiting three hours, and regarding this, the questioner responded that it is a ta'ut, it's Minhag ta'ut, it's a mistaken custom, and they should either follow the Rama and wait one hour. That's what we saw last week. Or they should follow Maran Shulchan Aruch and wait six hours. But three hours has no source and is a mistake. That's what the questioner brought down. He says, in truth, their custom is also mentioned. So this is what most people will tell you. If you ask most people, this is what they quote, that the three hours is a mistake. But he, he continues and says, Be'emet. In truth, their custom is also mentioned by our teachers, the Achronim, see the Darkei Teshuvah, who cites the Be'er Hetev, and the Pitchei Teshuvah, and the Sefer Mater Ephraim HaSefaradi, and the Sefer Mizmor David of Rab David Pardo, who mentioned the custom in a number of places to wait only three hours after eating meat, even in the summer. And this custom has what to rely on. Yesh alma lismoch. They have what to rely on. Why? Since in the winter, it would already be considered the time for the next meal. Okay, which means they're going to do something called Sha'ot zmaniot. When is an hour not an hour? Or when is six hours only three hours? In the winter. Think, for example, when there's only eight hours of, uh, of daylight in the peak of the winter, then it's not 12, 60-minute periods. There, the hours can only be 40 minutes, so it's a much less period of time. And so, therefore, since we allow that in the winter, we also allow that in the summer. From this, it can be proven that after three hours, the flavor does not carry over, and he elaborates there on this. In any event, it seems that since the German, since the Gemara, sorry, gave the time interval as between one meal and the next, if so, it depends on the time of the meal and the place where they eat. And since the time of eating for Torah scholars is the sixth hour, and the next time, next meal is in the evening, then in the winter, when the days are short, and the third hour in the afternoon is already dark, if so, one eats the second meal approximately three hours after the afternoon meal. Now, since it is only prohibited to eat meat and dairy in one meal and not during the second meal, therefore the customer rose to wait three hours. He's writing a number of different things here, the Mishneh uh, Halachot, that, uh, you know, in different places, they have what's known as afternoon tea. When I, growing up in England and living in Australia, afternoon tea, even morning tea, is very important. And what you have with your tea? A little bit of milk in your tea or, or dairy cake. And so therefore, they would say, there is a what to rely on, but only here. It's also mentioning that the nighttime meal might begin sooner than it is. And so therefore, although they're waiting that period of time, it's less than six hours. It could actually be only three hours. And therefore he concludes, in my humble opinion, it is obvious that anyone who has the fragrance of Torah must wait six hours, even if they come from a place where they were lenient. If one is stringent now, it will still not be included in do not abandon your mother's Torah. Alti tosh Torati mecha. And this is not an unnecessary stringency, for it seems from the majority of poskim and the majority of places that they held this way, and this is obvious. And, or as I was going to say, when he says, he says uh, obvious, pashut can also mean widespread as opposed to obvious. I just want to change the translation there. Sometimes when you read uh, halachic texts, pashut can often mean widespread as opposed to obvious. So 
although he comes and explains what those people who keep three hours, what they have to rely on, he concludes by saying, however, it's best to keep six hours. And as I said, that's why you'll see that unless there is a place which has a very strong tradition of keeping six hours, many places and many people are changing their minhag from three hours to keeping six hours. And I'm not gonna get into whether they should or they shouldn't be doing. I think if you have a proven minhag, it's fine. It's certainly not a minhag ta'ut, but uh, as it says, it's widespread, this six hour custom. And again, Rav Shlomo Zaman Arabach in his Sefer HaKashrut here in uh, source number 36 writes that, uh, again, even if someone has this established custom of three hours, uh, it's better that he change his custom to six hours. But uh, in source 37, he writes, however, women who are getting married, there's no reason for them uh, there's no reason for them to, that they are forced to change them in hugs. So if they wish to keep doing three hours, they can. So on the one hand, he says that uh, someone who wants to be strict upon themselves should go from three to six. On the other hand, a woman who is getting married and she wants to keep her min hug of three hours, she can. Okay, there's that. Now we want to get into this whole discussion of why we wait after eating meat before eating dairy. What is the reason given that we have to do this? So we hinted at it a, bit, a little bit beforehand, and Harambam writes here in source number 38, Why? Why, does he, why can't he eat cheese afterwards? And the reason he says is because the meat between the teeth is not removed by a gentle rinsing. You're going to have to really get out the toothpicks. You're going to have to brush your teeth. You're going to have to floss. And people aren't going to be careful with that. They're going to brush their teeth when they wake up, and they're going to brush their teeth before they go to bed. But at lunchtime, if they had a meat meal, they're not going to be flossing before having their dairy. That's what the Rambam, that's what the Rambam says. The Gemara there says, And they asked this question. Rav Acha said, Bar Yosef said to Rav Chizda, It is meat between the teeth. What's the din? Am I allowed to eat dairy if I've already waited the prescribed time? And he quotes a pasuk about uh, Slav. Habasar odenu ben shinehem. The meat was still between their teeth. And Rashi explaining that says, Mishum de basar motzi shuman. When you eat red meat, fat comes out of it, produces a it clings to the palate of the mouth, the roof of the mouth, and the taste remains that much longer. And this is why, for Sfaradim at least, why we're careful from meat to dairy and not so careful from dairy to meat. Because from meat to dairy, we're saying the meat, the taste of the meat, the flavor remains there for a long time, especially red meat. So there's a number of practical halachic ramifications which arise between these two reasons given. One who chews meat but does not swallow, e.g. for a baby. According to the Rambam, one must wait, since there may be meat still stuck between the teeth. But according to Rashi, it would see that one does not need to wait, since one did not swallow and the flavor therefore does not linger in one's mouth. Meat that remains after six hours, according to the Rambam, it no longer has the status of meat, since he holds that the whole reason for waiting six hours is due to the meat in the teeth. But according to Rashi, it seems that it still is considered meat. And number three, eating the fat of meat or a meat soup without meat pieces, according to the Rambam, one would not have to wait, 
it says no actual meat was consumed. Whereas according to Rashi, one needs to wait due to the lingering taste, which remains in this case as well. And the Torah and Shulchan Aruch do something fascinating. They say you need to follow the strictures of both of them. So we don't say, I'm going to follow like Rambam and not like Rashi, or I follow like Rashi and not like Rambam. He says, no, Rambam plus Rashi equals Maran Shulchan Aruch. And you can see that there in source number 41, that you have to wait there. The Tov La'achar Bechumrei Shtei It's good to be strict after both of their reasons. Okay, so there we go. Now the question is, is there any cases where neither Rashi or Rambam would be applicable, where perhaps you could have meat and then have dairy afterwards? He says, according to the pre-Megadim, quoted by the Pitchei Teshuvah, if one chews a piece of meat that consists of fat alone, Although neither reason is applicable, one should wait nevertheless in order not to distinguish between different cases of chewing. So there, even in that case where you say no, neither position holds, the Pitchei Tshuvah says we should always be careful to make sure we're waiting six hours or, or as much as possible because we have this concept called lo plug. We don't want to create... Uh, groupings and distinctions where some people are doing it and some people are not, or some meets yes and some meets no, and so therefore it's best to say six hours for everything, and if you want to be lenient, perhaps five and a half hours or something, but certainly uh, it still has a wait time. There is one exception to that, and again, Rav Orabach in the Sefer HaKashut in source number 43 explains if one tasted and then spat it out, that the person is a chef, or they're tasting the food to make sure that it's fit uh, to eat, in that case, since they're not, they're not swallowing, they're not chewing, they're just tasting it and then spitting it out, in that case, halo espasa, one chews it, Upolta and spits it out. He needs to wait six hours. Aval hato But if he just tasted it and spit it out, mebli lolaso without chewing, eno mechuyav b'hamtanakla. Then you don't have to wait at all. But dialogue bikinua hushtifata pe. And there it's enough just to uh, rinse out, uh, uh, wash the hands and rinse out the mouth. So therefore, we could see that there, there is room to be lenient if one likes to do that. Although, as a, a man, as you know, who, as, as I myself, who endures food, there's no way that I would be trying something without uh, chewing it. So I, I never fit into this category. I'm always uh, guilty of having to wait six hours. So if I, if I get a taster, it's always um, something a little bit more significant than that. Uh, another w- w- area to be lenient, is, says Rav Moshe Feinstein in Igrot Moshe there in source number 44, is taking uh, pills which are made of meat, uh, such as vitamins or whatever. And in that case, he says, one doesn't need to wait uh, six hours in that case. Uh, because it's not really considered food and one could have dairy afterwards. So if it's a pill, which is, uh, which is a meat uh, thing, then therefore it's not a thing. And then if you want to see me afterwards, it's just a question about that. When it comes to uh, meat, which is broken down into the form of a vitamin or something like that, obviously it's better to have it with a hechsher, but since it's not actually food and it's there for as a medicine, it's strictly speaking, it doesn't have to have a hechsher. Okay, next topic. Should children wait between meat and dairy? You know, again, you know how the kids, they start nagging and they want to have their ice cream already, they want to have something. Is there room to be lenient there for them. And 
What about so? What about kids here? The Meiri writes the the davka katan she'en koach bal l'shahot sheshaot, where it's hard for the child to wait six hours. Ustsudotav tekufot zolazo, and they find that uh, they have their meals are much closer together, and that their stomachs digest the food much faster. But there we also have the question of the basar bein hashinehem. What about the uh, the meat between the teeth? And they are lenient from here to say that one need not give the measurement of six hours. Rather, when one finishes this meal and begins to eat another meal, even within six hours, uh, six hours are not mentioned here just from one meal to the next. And even though the idea does not seem correct, since the unspecified expression from one meal to the next means a regular case, which is the measurement of six hours, at least for an adult. And if it is not the case, you have allowed your words to be interpreted into different measurements, what we call your words have gone into shiurim. Nevertheless, at least concerning chicken, poultry, it seems to me to rule that this way, since it is digested more easily and the status of meat is more easily removed from it than another meal. So we read the words of the Meiri carefully. It seems to be he was not be lenient on a red meat meal. You have to wait six hours, no matter what your age, no matter what your digestion, no matter how often you eat, you need to be careful. But regarding uh, having chicken, since the chicken, the taste doesn't remain, since it digests quickly, since it doesn't remain in the teeth, all the reasons given above, we can be lenient, says the Meiri in that case, and wait less than six hours. And uh, here we see on, the, on, on source number 46, on the top of page 47, uh, in Sheva Talevi, Ravosna rules that uh, regarding small children between eating meat and eating cheese, for small, small children under five or six, there's no reason for small children under the age of chinuch to wait. But here he says that he, that he thinks this is not really, he, he says it's under the age of three is this. I mean, it's a question of, uh, chinuch is normally f uh, five or six. He wants to say it's uh, under the age of three. I'm wondering how many, under your age of three, how many of them are having red meat? But uh, there we go. Uh, and he co continues there that when they're slightly older, that uh, they should be waiting six hours because it's a bad chinuch. It's, uh, if you tell the kids they can do it, then uh, it's going to be a lot harder to teach them to do it when they get older. But I think this is one of those cases where I think Again, I don't want to go against Rav Vosner, but uh, if they're under five or six, I don't see a problem. But once they are at an age of understanding, and sometimes that can be younger than five or six, but once they get to that age of understanding, that uh, one should be careful with them so that they don't learn bad habits. Uh, ah, here we go. If you see here, Hacham Ovadja is lenient even for older children. He says, Regarding small children, there is room to be lenient. But then he writes, because it is known that the poskim debate whether it is permitted to feed something which is rabbinically prohibited food to a child. Are you allowed to give it to them directly? He says, even if they're older than five or six, let's say they're 
9 or 10, strictly speaking, something which is only rabbinically prohibited is allowed for children. But then he says that one needs to be careful here that uh, if it's only a, a symbol, Isur de Rabbanan, the Rambam says that one shouldn't do this because they're going to learn bad habits. If you're going to tell them that all the Isur de Rabbanan, all the things which are only rabbinically prohibited, that they can do, then what's going to happen is they're never going to keep it once they are over bar or bat mitzvah. So for Hacham of Adya, he says, no, there needs to be more of a situation where we would be lenient. Therefore, he writes, Vechein, in the Nidon Didan, in our case, Hoyel Gufa Davar Shinui B'machloket, since our case is a dispute in Halacha, because remember, this isn't, the case isn't dealing with eating meat and milk together. We're talking about eating meat and waiting. And since the question is how long the wait time, the wait time is the machloket. There, in that case, he says, this is a sfek sfeka. This is a double doubt. It's not just an isor de rabbanan. It's not just something which is rabbinically prohibited. It's something which is a double doubt if it's prohibited. And therefore, one can rely on the lenient position to say that for children, even above chinuch, they can do so. And when do we say this? Specifically when there's a child who is maybe, they're not growing as fast as they should, or they're not as healthy as they should. And therefore, we can definitely add those two points together. But once the children are a little older, we should be careful with this. Okay, and, and then you could, if you want to look at this in more detail, you can see sources 49, 50, and 51, but I'm going to uh, skip those for now because you get the, uh, the sense of the idea. Turn over to page 50. Page 50 and 51 deal with the question about what happens if one is uncertain whether they had waited the time. You know, me, I know exactly when I have lunch, I know exactly when I have breakfast, I know exactly when I have dinner, any food, I know exactly when it's for a couple of reasons. One, I love food, and and second, uh, I'm just very puntoso. I, I, I'm very precise on things, and I know exactly uh, when I do them. But there are many of us who are not careful about that. We don't pay attention to when we eat. We don't pay attention to what we eat. We don't pay attention when we eat. So the question is, if I'm uncertain about it, do I need to be Strict, do I need to be lenient or can I be lenient? So, here the Yadi Huda writes as follows Mishum de Have Dava Shesh Lo Matirin, the Fizenire de Huadin Name, Besheesh Lo Safek in Yesha Shaot, Name Turklam Tin, Ad Shee Vadai, the Ain Matirin Mitam Sveka de Rabanan, Kevin de Have. So the Yad Yehuda wants to do something, and this is a complicated area of halacha, but I'm going to explain it to you. I remember this in uh, my first year of smicha studies. We did something called uh, the studies of Sfek uh, Sveka in Yoredeya, Siman Kufyud. And it's all these questions of double doubts and when you can be lenient, and when you can't, and when can you imply this, and when can you imply that. And there's a problem with something called a davar sheyeshlo matirin. We're never ever lenient with, for example, chametz on Pesach. Why? Because it was permitted before Pesach, and it will be permitted after Pesach if you sold it. But since you didn't sell it on Pesach, we're going to be super strict. Similarly, with eggs which are born on Yom Tov, they're a davar she'yosh matirin. They'll be permitted after Yom Tov, and so therefore you're not allowed to eat those eggs on Yom Tov. We don't apply this rule of safek sveka. Same too, he wants to imply that regarding basar bechalav, 
I'm going to, after a period of time, no longer be carne. I'm not going to be fleshic. I'm not going to be meaty. And so therefore, I shall be able to eat the dairy, provided I've waited enough time. So the Yad Yehuda says, we should apply the rule of Sfex Feka. Sorry, we should apply the rule of Davar Sheesh it is It is something which will be permitted eventually and make the person wait. So if they don't know when they finished eating, be strict. If you think it was two or you think it was three, just wait an extra hour. Uh, but other poskim are more lenient and they rule like Hacham of Ajay Yosef ruled that this is not a Davar Sheyeshlomatir in, in this case because the whole position of waiting is a machloket and therefore if someone thinks, if someone is Samech Ala HaMekel, Keshiyev Shalev Arech, Loyev said, if someone wants to rely on that lenient position, they can rely on it, they don't have to apply this approach of Svek, Sveka, uh, they, so they have to apply this approach of it being a Devash Eshno Matirin. They can rely on, it's a double doubt, and yes, they can eat. Okay? And then you can see again more of this in 54. But again, this is a very technical, this is a very technical area. But uh, as I said, uh, to be strict here and apply this concept of a Devashi Eshlomatirin, I think that's, uh, as you would say in the classics, it's a little far-fetched for me. It's a little too far. And I like the position of uh, the Yaakut Yosef to say that someone can be lenient in that matter. So here we see, and you have the summary here, on pages 52 and 53 of all the shitot that we've been, and I encourage you, if you have these books, to read these summaries. It gives you little one-liners about everything that we've seen, and you can see everything that we've read there over the last uh, two sessions. It's uh, really very good reading, and if you want to get this sefer, please let me know. We have a few of them still available in the office. Uh, I thought we'd look at, for the last few minutes, there's a little piece here called uh, The Future of Meat, okay? And it's a whole position on whether we can rely rely on, what is, you know, when you go for this, like, uh, grow and behold, not grow and behold, when you have, like, uh, I'm not good at these names, because uh, I'm, not, I'm not eating these types of food anymore, because uh, I'm still being very careful on what I eat. But, you know, you can get these... Uh, Someone help me out and unmute yourselves. What's that called where you have these uh, meats, which is, it's made from, it's a plant-based meat. What's it called? Impossible burger. There you go, Larry. I knew you. I, I know you've had one. I, I've had it <laughs> once. Yeah. <It's laughs> so I'm talking like about this. In 2013, let's read this together. Uh, in 2013, uh, when Dutch scientist uh, Mark Post unveiled the first lab-grown hamburger, Many began to ask whether we might be approaching the age of kosher cheeseburgers. And again, when I'm not on a strict diet or a strict eating regime, this to me could be very exciting. The new entity was touted to have the same appearance, texture, and taste of regular meat, but it had been grown in a completely revolutionary way, prompting some to speculate that there might be a new form of kosher meat that could be parv and perhaps even sourced from a non-kosher animal. At the time, the discussion was purely speculative. The cost of the burger had been astronomical, $330,000. The entire event had been somewhat of a media stunt. However, six years later, at the time of writing of this article, many entrepreneurs, investors, and scientists around the world now agree that it is a question of when rather than if lab-grown meat will hit the shelves. So here we're not really talking about uh, the Impossible Burger, which is plant-based. Here they're actually talking about meat grown in a lab. So it's actually meat, meat. But because it's grown in a lab, is it considered halachically meat? In December 2018, it was named by Scientific American as one of the top 10 emerging technologies of the year. And with several dozen companies around the world working on it, the cost is bound to come down to. As a concept of cultured meat, also known by many other names, clean meat, cell-based meat, slaughter-free meat, cultivated meat, moves from the realm of science fiction to the world of fact, 
so too the question of its halakhic status has moved from being a theoretical to a practical one that needs to be answered with increasing urgency. Before the technology has been perfected and the product is being sold, Poskim will need to evaluate the process to determine whether the product will be kosher or not and whether it will have meaty status. If it is considered kosher and it is given the status of meat, the one would presumably have to wait the same amount of time before eating dairy as regular meat, as the two main reasons for waiting would likely apply to this meat as well. To date, several articles have been published regarding the kosher status of a cultured meat product, and there has been much media speculation as well. But an authoritative halachic ruling has yet to emerge. Part of the reason for this is that any, pos- any psak must be grounded in a thorough understanding of the technology involved. At present, this is difficult for two reasons. First, much of the method behind the development is being closely guarded by the companies involved as they race to be the first to market the new product. And second, much of the exact specification of how the final product will look is still unknown to the companies themselves. As a nascent product still under development, it remains possible that uh, methods of extraction and culturing and production of the cells that ultimately grow into meat may change and with it the halakhic status of the soon to hit the shelves cultivated meat. Okay, so if you go into this, there's a lot going on. And I just did this to whet your appetite a little bit. What I'd like you to do if you have this book is to just go through this and have a look at it. As I said, once again, if you are in Seattle and you're able to come and pick up the book, great. And there's a problem with it, please let me know and I'm sure we can have them delivered to you. There's a few pages here, it goes on into it, into the into this whole discussion here. A little bit more about this and into the process. There's a lot of halachic concepts here going into it. And we'll conclude here with uh, his conclusion. And he writes, but again, please read it if you have the time. Rav Asher Weiss also recently addressed the question of what the kosher status of a cultured meat product will be. His response is particularly significant in that it marks the first time a posek has addressed the issue both through a deep understanding of the science involved and as a matter of practical relevance. His unequivocal conclusion was that the final product would have to be considered meat since under the microscope, a cultured meat product will be identical to the meat production from an animal it is regarded as meat, irrespective of how it came into the world. Regarding the other issues addressed related to the source of the cells, the issue remains inconclusive, but there certainly are concerns to be noted and which may be prohibitive if the cells are not taken from a kosher slaughtered animal. As with any developing technology, time will tell as to whether new developments may alleviate some of the questions raised and pave the way for kosher cultured meat. We are faced with a reality that has never existed before, and it remains to the post scheme to determine precisely how to apply to it the eternal principles of our Torah. As science marches on, halacha will continue to seek out and provide answers and provide the expression of Torah in our daily lives in ways that were previously unimagined. And uh, here we go. That's the conclusion of Rabbi Asher Weiss, who's a major posek today and is explaining to us something very fundamental to us, and that is that we have to be very careful with all of this in how we are dealing with these matters. And it's not just a straightforward, is it or isn't it? But I will tell you that some things which may look like meat, but aren't meat, because of merit iron, there are areas where over time we have become lenient with, and some things which remain strict with despite the passage of time. For example, it used to be, if you want to have something which is uh, a non-dairy milk, for example, an almond milk on the table, uh, on, you'd have to have the almond milk package on the table to say, this is non-dairy milk. But today, since we know there's so many 
you know, uh, non-dairy milk alternatives, we don't need to bring that on the table. And so therefore you could have something which has chicken and almond milk cooked together and no one's going to worry that it is chicken and cow milk. They'll know that it is almond milk. So it might come a time where something like this, where these uh, meat cells are developed and we can establish them that they are. Again, who knows, we'll see as time develops. But as I said, for those of us who want to have, we do have those impossible burgers that uh, Larry was mentioning, or Beyond Burgers, and you can have those at Island Crust with your uh, cheese. I know that they've been selling those like hotcakes. It is 7.45, it's the end of our session for tonight. And next week, I do have a special announcement. Next week, the Vada Rabbanim of Greater Seattle, the rabbis of Seattle, are having a special learning session for Shavuot, and that's going to be at 7.30. And all the rabbis are going to be speaking. I'll be speaking there, Rabbi Kotenik, uh, Rabbi Levitin, Rabbi Kornfeld, uh, Rabbi Farkash, uh, Rabbi Ben Zaken, of course. Uh, so please join us for, that's going to be a special program next week at 7.30. So I think next week we're going to take a pause and the week after we'll, we'll join back together and we'll learn waiting from milk, from after eating milk to going to eating meat. And we'll learn about some of the minhagim there, some of the customs that we have there. Thanks very much for joining me. Does anyone have any questions?